R is for revelation in our ABCs of modified theology. Revelation is one of those topics that is passionate. It is sure to bring raised blood pressure and maybe even raised voices, no matter which revelation you mean. So it can mean two really different things. One is revelation simply means the way that we know anything about the divine reality or the way that God reveals something. But revelation to most conservative evangelical or charismatic Christians will refer to the last book in the New Testament that talks about the end of the world in many views. Both are very serious topics in their respective arenas, so we want to deal with both of them well. So let's start with the first one. Revelation often refers to the process by which God discloses the divine nature and the mystery of the divine will and purposes to human beings, and truth is disclosed. And this revelation is often parsed out into two different categories. One is general revelation, which concerns what can be known and ascertained through nature or history. The other is special revelation, and it's used to designate that which can be known through particular or special people and events. And this is often related to salvation, which we will talk about more next week with S. Now, those who are suspicious of general revelation say that it can be misleading to try and decipher things about a perfect God from a fallen world. Those who are suspicious of special revelation say that it reeks of fideism, which we covered in F, and that only those who believe or have read the Bible or are empowered by the Holy Spirit can truly understand. There are lots of camps that have really profound things to say about revelation. For those in the evangelical camp, they often look to thinkers like Karl Barth as the final word on the subject. For Barth, revelation happens in Christ alone. And apart from Christ, mankind has no help in any way of coming to the knowledge of the divine reality. More liberal or progressive camps bristle at this, the whole line of reasoning, because it seems elitist and exclusionary and too narrow. Surely the God of the universe can be seen or at least partially known in other religions or cultures around the world. Pluralism is our word for the era. This plurality makes me very cautious about privileging or bracketing or siloing any realm of knowledge and protecting it from review to outside areas of knowledge protecting it from review to anything that would impinge upon it like science or psychology. I propose that all information, including revelation, needs to be subjected to a correspondence theory of interplay and accountability. History is too clear about the dangers of allowing one arena to be exempt from critique. Now, once you go down that road, you have to have a second conversation, which is which field is in a supervisory role? Which, which area watches over what information? And who submits to who when there's conflict? So there has to be a mutually agreed upon standard. And when the standard is established, whose authority watches over it? Let's be honest. Knowledge is a contested arena. History is full of dogmas and ideologies and programs that have shown themselves to be terrible masters and have resulted in both domination and devastation. So when we privilege and protect revelation, right, our religious convictions, from outside review, we get into trouble. Now, on a totally different note, growing up when someone said revelation they always meant that last book of the bible the book of revelation the apocalyptic letter that closes out the new testament i love the book of revelation i used to study it all the time i'm inspired by it and challenged by it i'm constantly referring to the imagery that's in it the only thing i don't like is what people do with the book of revelation one they think it's about the end of the world not. Number two, they think it has something to do with the 21st century. It probably doesn't. And three, it is really scary. It terrifies people, but it's actually a message of hope. The early audience of that book would have taken great consolation and comfort from it. 
The sad thing is that we should be writing a book like Revelation for our time, but we don't because we think that John's letter is about our time. It has stunted our Christian or apocalyptic imagination of trying to imagine that the world could be a different way because we think that it's already written in the stars, that the final chapter is already written. So the book of Revelation was written in a literary form called apocalyptic. It's part of the genre that we covered in G is for genre. It's called the literature of the oppressed. When you live in an occupied territory under an oppressive regime, you write in code. You use imagery, you use allegory and analogy. You're not free to say what you really want to say, so you have to be creative. This is what prophets do. They don't so much tell the future, they're not future tellers. They tell the truth in interesting ways. The book of Revelation is a prophetic critique and a prophetic hope about those first couple centuries of the churches. It was meant to give hope and raise expectations for those early believers. We should study the form and then harness that same prophetic imagination that the author of a Revelation had and use it for our time. But unfortunately, we have a failure of imagination because we've been taught to think that Revelation is about our time. There are thousands of examples of how that imagery found in the book of Revelation was pretty genius, actually, and it was appropriate for those first two centuries. It has so many touch points. Wouldn't it be amazing if we let go of this notion that Revelation is future telling and, and about our time, and we harness that prophetic imagination to do a work like that for our time? And God knows we need it to imagine that the world could be a different way and to critique the powers that be and point to a preferable future. Open up possibilities for change.